this is exciting, a chance to give some light on the great work that you're doing at DSAL and, um, and how it connects with the idea of creating positive social change in the community. So I, I thought we would start by having you really explain the overall work of DSAL and in its goal of reducing crime and recidivism. Recidivism. You could just explain some of the things like what are the principles and values that guide your work, um, what you mean by social capital and, and its development, and um, some of the programs that you administer. So just sort of giving us a big picture of the work you're doing and why you're doing it. Who would like to start first? Sure. Um, so I'm a lieutenant with the Sheriff's Office, Alameda County Sheriff's Office. And, um, about 10 years ago now, we started what uh, we call Deputy Sheriff's Activities League, or DSAM, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization separate from the Sheriff's Office, but with, with, um, which works closely in alignment with the Sheriff's Office to do uh, crime prevention, uh, neighborhood building, um, uh, recidivism reduction, crime reduction, relationship building. And it's the sheriff's office um, aim to uh, engage in in uh, crime prevention and recidivism reduction work by uh, going to the roots of what drives crime. And um, so DSAL is sort of a manifestation of that of that goal and the programs of DSAL and um, and in many respects, um, although this was created through. Um, of vast county partnership, the Reach Out uh, Youth Center kind of stands as, as a monument to that effort. Um, would you agree? I would agree. Okay. How would you describe some of the programs that you undertake? Well, I think that, you know, a lot of police activities leagues are set up to do athletic programs because there's a fundamental belief that um, if you can introduce healthy habits to young people at an early age, that perhaps they, um, they develop those habits as habits and um, can carry them on in their lives rather than doing an unhealthy uh, habit and having that become their habit. So we've, we started by doing that. Um, how many healthy habits can we create for young people? Um, and when um, when we started doing that, we created anything from bowling to cooking classes to golfing. Um, we, what were some of the other early on ones that we did? Um, dance classes. Um, all, we did a variety of things that were sort of around the community. Um, and then what we learned is that we needed, well, we wanted to always do more. You know, we get 10 kids here, 20 kids here, another 15 here, what's the next thing? So Marty said, you know, Hillary, start a soccer league. I think that'll be an important endeavor to take on. So we started a soccer league, and it was um, total chaos, but what came out of the chaos was what you refer to as social capital. Um, perhaps it is in human nature to want to help when you see there's a good reason to help. And I know I looked like I needed help when there were 600 kids that wanted to play soccer and only two adults out there in charge of them. So a lot of parents stepped up and those parents were, um, were asked to continue helping and they did. They all stepped into coaching roles. Um, we formed a soccer advisory board made up of those parents and now Six years later, we just completed well, we just completed our sixth season with 1,300 kids, over 100 adult volunteers as coaches and soccer parents, uh, team parents. Um, we created 21 jobs for youth referees, and um, and every team did community service to pay it forward. Um, and now many of those same parents are working on planning a, a block party this Friday for the rest of the community. So that is. Um, social capital achieved. Um, we are supportive and we're facilitating with our staff involvement and the sheriff's office deputies, you know, making sure it's safe 
but also helping the community understand um, what they can do to help make this, the place safe. Um, and that has been the case um, now in many of our programs. So our basketball league has turned into the same thing, run by parents, a parent advisory board. They do their own fundraising. Um, they are getting trained to be their, to be coaches and referees so they can take on the league and we don't have to, um, we're not, DSAL is no longer the answer. DSAL is the facilitator to the answer. Um, and that's, I think, an achievement of, of the succession of programs that we've done here. And it's a similar story with this building. I mean, we started the youth leadership group because the youth wanted a group to be a part of. But that led to their advocacy for what they needed and us supporting their advocacy so that they could demand what they needed. And now you're, we're sitting in a $23 million building that they demanded. Um, so it's another example of, of social capital and change that has occurred as a result of that. I just might add that you're, we're in Ashland right now. The um, Alameda County Sheriff's Office patrol jurisdiction is the unincorporated area of Alameda County to include these communities, the Ashland, Sheridan, and also San Lorenzo, um, unincorporated Hayward, and Castro Valley. So it's about 150,000 people, give or take. And if, if it were a city, it would be the third largest patrol area um, in the county. So Oakland, I think Fremont second, and then we would be third. So it's a big area. And in Ashland, Cherryland, um, Ashland, Cherryland is actually um, the most densely populated um, areas in Alameda County. Um, there's about 32,000 people in these small communities. Um, we estimate there's about 8,000 ex-offenders. So, um, it's a high concentration of people who've been through the system. Um, so in order to, so, so that, that population, as we've said, um, those folks who've been through the system have a, have a child, a son or a daughter, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. Um, if each of those 8,000 has one person connected to them in town, that's about half our population that has been affected and impacted by the criminal justice system. <clears throat> so we run the jail, the Alameda County Jail. So um, among the things that we've done was to uh, begin to look at that as a community policing resource and begin the process of, of, of um, looking at rehabilitation as a community policing imperative. That is, you have to bring down recidivism rates um, in order to bring down your crime rate. And um, so that's another component of, of what, what we try to do. I would also say that um, there are substantial populations of African Americans and first generation um, Hispanic people in Ashland, Sheridan in particular. The soccer league is made up of folks um, from those backgrounds. The sheriff's office hasn't done a particularly great job um, historically of going out and engaging those populations. Um, we do a, we've done, I think, a great job of community policing in that we've made available opportunities for people to come to us and talk to us, right? But we haven't necessarily gone and went out and initiated conversations with them. Soccer is that attempt to go do that. So, so in a community where there are very few institutions through which people could talk to their local government or talk to the cops, talk to the sheriff's office, we've created probably three or four or five of them. And um, those community institutions, I think, are another way of saying social capital. Um, provides people from all of our communities and all walks of life the opportunity to connect with the authorities, to voice their, what, so, and here's the thing, man. it's not always some major calamity that they want a voice about. So the, the soccer league wants safe fields. They want fields where they can have their, sell their concessions and make money to support the league without vendors uh, coming on their site and undercutting their, their opportunity to do that. Basic things that communities want and need from their police department. So they voice that to our community police. And 
and as they do that, and as you build up that relationship of asking for something and having it met, um, that's the, the that's the capital. That's the that's how communities function. That's how kids grow. So we have you know, among the projects that we're doing is an explorer, police explorer, and we have many um, minority kids in the explorer, as we do in every other. Program. So um, we are really creating, I think. So the sheriff's office is engaged in creating opportunities around the core issues facing the community. We've actually gone out and made that a priority. Um, that's different than not talking to your community and taking what comes. So, and that to me, that's enfranchisement, right? Enfranchisement happens on every, on many different levels. And so I think that's, Tents are reach members. Tents are reach members. Everybody stop. Tents here. And, and then I wanted to add one other thing to that too, just as an example. Um, in the the convergence of how DCL started with some of these smaller programs and to where it is now, but um, now that we do continue to add up these opportunities, so that one of our things that we've added is a pickup basketball game for young men. And it's three nights a week here at the gym, and it goes until 10 p.m. There's 70 guys that are up there playing, uh, up to 25 years old, and that's another population of of this area that I don't think anybody's figured right. out how to support or engage with in a positive manner. And now we have 70 guys under 25 years old playing basketball till 10 p.m. And the other night, um, one of the deputies here. Uh, went over there just to, you know, support them and be around to support them. And he, a young lady approached him and said, hey, um, my dad is abusing me and I don't want to go home. And he was able to help her deal with that time. It had nothing to do with basketball, but it had something to do with him supporting something happening here in this community. Um, he was available to this community and he was accessed by the community. And he was able to go to the dad's house, talk to the dad, make it, figure out what was going on and make sure this girl was safe. Um, that wouldn't happen if, if we didn't have these opportunities here up till 10 o'clock at night um, with the deputies being connected to it. Could you just explain what you mean by social capital? Like what, what is that term about? Well, I mean, uh, Hillary's um, social capital expert. Um, but for me, it's, um, it's, it's, so it's the creation of, of um, it's the building of institutions which can then engage the process. It's enfranchisement. Right? I think enfranchisement happens um, on various levels. And typically, one's, one's democratic voice is heard you know, through the ballot box, for one, but also through whatever organizations you happen to belong to. So the, the creation of those institutions through which one can express their voice in communities where there aren't any is, to me, the building of social capital. I agree. I mean, I think if if you have money and you have you know you have the power to use your money to get something you want, that's a version of capital, right? You you have the the means to do something that you want to do. And I think when it's social capital, it's knowing somehow really truly knowing that you have the ability to influence the world around you and, and do something about it for the good. So I wonder, for instance, like in Ferguson, Missouri, where three quarters of the population is African American and one council person is African American. How does something, how does a situation like that exist? Only six percent of the African American population who's registered to vote. Oh. Right. So I mean, I think that there's a dearth of, of leadership. There's a dearth of, of social capital. I think those if you create and, and 
build institutions within your community that can then make that transaction that, that who can then express a collective voice for a specific outcome. How do you involve other agencies in the county in your work? With, with how, what kind of collaboration do you... Well, it seems like... Um, it seems like the Sheriff's Office is an example of an agency that's made a determination that something has to be done differently. And the determination that you can't arrest your way out of this situation and you have to do something differently has led to a lot of support for you know what Marty has created, not only the nonprofit, but a civilian running the nonprofit. Now he has two deputies and a sergeant getting another two deputies, all for the purpose of this team doing this work in this community because that's the conclusion that they've come to. And then I think social services, the social services agency has come to a similar conclusion where they realize that they can't just keep giving away benefits in hopes that people will change their behaviors, that uh, they'll, they'll do the right, or you know, that something will be different if they just keep doing the same thing. So now they have begun to support us in what we've created with our Dig Deep Farms operation because we wanted to create jobs and grow food, healthy food for, for folks in the community. And, and we accept, you know, food stamps. So social services agency wants the same thing. They want jobs for their, their CalWORKs clients. They want healthy food for their food stamps clients. And they can, they can increase both of those by supporting our operation. So they've become a big partner with us. And the same goes for healthcare. Um, well, at least it should be more probably. <laughs> but hypothetically, you know, what, everything we're doing is having an impact on, on public health. Um, people are eating healthier, people are exercising more, people are less likely to be violent. Those are all public health factors. Um, it's very much in alignment with what their goals are. Yeah, I mean, I would say that along with there being 8,000 ex-offenders in Ashland, Cheyenne, <clears throat> the health disparities within Ashland Cherryland are way, the disparities in Ashland Cherryland. The, the rates of diabetes, childhood obesity, heart disease, all of those chronic illnesses created by lifestyle and bad diets work well, well above county averages. Um, unemployment rate is several ticks, above, probably more than several ticks above the county average. Um, if you ride up and down these streets, at least at this stage of the game, um, Probably every third building, every fourth building is vacant. Um, so there's not like a necessarily a vibrant economy thriving here. So all, and you, you, it would be similar, I think, in West Oakland and in East Oakland and in South Hayward, uh, where there are similar pockets uh, of poverty. And uh, so I think, as Hillary was saying, there's this recognition across the different agencies and the different sectors that you can't. Um, you can't solve for one without addressing the others, right? Um, education and jobs and housing are all components that drive crime. Crime is a component that drives homelessness. The biggest homeless shelter in Alameda County is Santa Rita Jail, right? The biggest mental health facility in Alameda County is Santa Rita Jail. So these are interconnected issues um, that require um, integrated thinking, and I think increasingly um, agencies are recognizing And So along those lines, I think you've already made some statements to this effect, but how do you feel the work you're doing through DCEL has affected the way Juan Ramirez law enforcement is done Ramirez in, Ramirez in the sheriff's Thank department? You. And what, what shifts do you see occurring? So I would point out first that AB 109, the prisoner realignment bill that uh, Governor Brown Past several years ago has been a um, major, um, um, major legislation that's changed how many people view policing and, and um, prisons and, and the whole that whole gamut. And I think that that dynamic is, is playing out across the country because prisons have, have um, 
can't afford to, to, to keep putting people away. Literally, it, it's bankrupting the state. <clears throat> so they're reducing the prison size and, and, um, and redirecting state, pe state prisoners back to county levels, and it's causing um, it's causing local jurisdictions to, to, to determine how they're going to handle that load of folks coming back into their jurisdictions. So that's caused a, a that's caused people to, to be open to um, new ideas around recidivism reduction and community policing and, and so forth and so on. And, um, and the sheriff's office, I think, has been a lead agency in, in that thinking. And I would say I would I would say this. Um, Five or six years ago, I was I was a lone wolf working in a closet up at our patrol <laughs> station, literally. And uh, and Hillary mentioned the deputies and, and the desal people that we got employed. But I also, under my Ballywick, um, will have a staff of 21 mental health workers. Um, so so for me in a closet to a staff of. Uh, all with the sworn and Hillary and, and and the mental health workers, a staff of 27 people, and um, that doesn't include the de the nonprofit staff. And it doesn't include the nonprofit staff, which it's another 14. Arguably, is one of the leading employers in Asheville, <laughs> believe it or not, right? Um, so, so that's I think that, um, and then so the the, the the sheriff's office has also made fun funding available to us. Um, um, so I, I mean I think that the growth of what we're we're we're, uh, we're bridged into our jail right now. I mean I think we're we're as, as you know we're we're um, heavily involved in the reentry um, operations and we're really sort of crafting what reentry looks like in the county. I'll say that that's kind of a bold statement, but I think it's true. Um, so, so we're taking up we've taken up a lot of space, um, uh, and several millions of dollars in budget um, now that we did before. Um, I think also that the interplay between uh, like Hillary's operation with our what we call our commission, our community oriented policing problem solving, which has grown from four to eight or nine deputies over the last several years, that. <coughs> Um, has been sort of a force multiplier for us. So this this method of policing, I think, is is increasingly influencing uh, operations within the sheriff's office. I uh, I was just going to add. I would think just thinking about the community policing unit. I mean, even before. Marty had his sworn team here. They were supporting our various endeavors that we were putting into place in the community, including driving around a mobile recreation unit, um, which was at the time a, put in an old FEMA trailer from Hurricane Katrina. And all we had, we'd, you'd pull out of there, you know, sumo suits and jumpers and, um, you know, hula hoops and tug of war. and. And it's this huge thing, and it was dragged all over town by this a sergeant from you know, the, the, the unit. And now we we have a mobile rock wall, and he's driving that around now. <laughs> and it's for the it's for the community's benefit, and he that he benefits, and that his unit benefits because they get to be introduced to new parts of the community that don't come to their meetings or aren't signing up for the community watches. Um, you know, every year he comes to our soccer league opening and closing day ceremonies and, and all the kids know him. All the kids want to get on his motorcycle. All the kids want a sticker. You know, it's the deputies that come out now, they can't, their cheeks hurt at the end of the day because of how much they have to smile for pictures. <laughs> and it's a, that's a very different uh, perception than what often, you know, is out there in the world to consume of what what's happening with, I, between communities and cops. I want to. So and we've been doing this. So when I started Desal almost ten years ago, um, probably ten years ago, um, started it in '04, incorporated it in '05. We started working together in 
07, 08, right around there. Um, you track team like those six. That's right. Um, so, 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 so all of this time, and then all of these little things, the guy going out and taking pictures with 100 kids, right? The, the deputies who were out talking to these kids every day. Um, the, the deputies who are talking to all of the kids, making them feel safe, and then taking the guy off who's not safe, right? Every day, right? Deputies that look like them, right? Every single day, that's the elbow grease. That's the, it doesn't happen, there's not some magic conversation that you have. It is like, it's like a relationship with your family. It's deep and it's meaningful because it's been forever. And that's, you gotta be willing to, to, to put that time in. And you can't, it's not a program. Programs don't change communities. People and relationship changes, change communities. And she has, probably more than anybody I know, been a person who has bent steel in terms of changing the community. Had kids sleeping on her couch. I'm sure that made her husband uh, ecstatic. Uh, um, can't say no to people who want to do change, right? And, and will push herself to the to the wall to make that happen and sometimes beyond the wall. That's the kind of, that's what makes change. With a handful of people like that, and then you add another handful and another handful, that's how stuff gets done. And it's just time. It's a function of time and effort. Yeah. And one more example just to add to that, is more most recently, you know, we, before um, Deputy Silva actually joined our team, she was here for the summer. Uh, last summer and uh, you know she didn't know us from anybody but she could tell what we were about and immediately got into it and uh, she started teaching a girl self-defense class here um, as one of the things that she was willing to do and put in time and energy into doing because she could feel what we could understand what we were trying to do and uh, she continued that even after she was done with us in the summer and went back to her other um, post as a school resource officer. She continued to come here to teach her girls self-defense class. And uh, and even when it was just a few kids in there, she was always there to teach that class. And it was for the purpose of doing a good thing, empowering these young people to be safe on the street. And she went, she heard a lot of, um, she got a lot of back, um, negative feedback um, from some of her peers, like, oh, you're teaching these kids how to fight, you're teaching these kids how to beat us. and. But she kept coming and she kept doing it because she, she knew it was important. So recently, one of the girls that was in her class for about a year uh, was walking home and uh, was um, a, there was a, a creep who attempted to, to take her and sexually assault her. And he had his pants put on, on his, around his ankles. And she gave him a, a heel punch to the palm heel strength. Palm heel strength to the nose and <laughs> kneed him in the groin. And she got out of there. Like an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> and she called the police. And the sheriff's office came, found the guy. Well, she ran here. Yeah. Right? She ran to a safe place. She made the report. Um, so I'll say this. A little 11-year-old African-American, right, who trusted the institution and trusted the police because she's got a relationship with the police. Um, and a skill. And we res the police responded, set up a perimeter, caught the guy. She was responsible for taking a, uh, a child molester off the street, this 11-year-old girl. So she sits down and she's with our investigators and they're interviewing her. And she tells them, so, uh, as the thing was going on, I delivered a palm heel strike to his nose, which was gin, which is, is what would you find in a police report right? so, in terms of defining the use of force. So she was within policy and procedure as well. But uh, so she listened, right? And this was a kid who I'm told is not like the the, the, the easiest kid to, not at all. you know, as many kids are, right? She's not like the ideal perfect fit kid, but she's learning something here and she's got a place here and she felt, um, obviously felt comfortable in it and learned and, and, uh, and she improved her community yeah. by getting him off she the street. She sure did.
and she, and she now knows that too. Yeah, she was all over the news. Right. So it just feels like it leads to this question, which is in terms of what you see as the possibility, what do you see as the potential? And I know Marty, you've mentioned the idea of the intersection, and you said before, public safety and, and public health. What, given that, what do you see as the ultimate potential that can result from the work that you're doing? healthier, safer community. Um, I mean, I think, Systems working together for a company. Yeah. Um, so, that's a great question. Um, so I grew up here many, many years ago, and, and uh, it was a blue-collar neighborhood with, um, with, um, with manufacturing jobs and jobs that allowed people to earn a living, put roofs over their heads and their kids through school um, in a broad way. And I think that world has disappeared. So I don't know if that world can ever be recreated. Um, and not that it was a perfect world, right? But the ability for, for people to earn a living, a dignified living where they feel like they're invested in their community. That's what I see um, down the road coming out of this. Um, because I think once you get to the place where you're talking the same language about what's driving problems, you generally get to poverty and, um, um, and hell, well poverty, right, which drives health and it drives crime and it drives a lot of things. How do you address the poverty issue? Clearly it's not, tell me what you get down this road, Sandy, but uh, it's clearly, I think, when, when communities are invested and, in, and, and, and um, enfranchised and they're expressing what is driving their problems through the political process, the political process will respond to them and that will mean investment and how do you get to investment? I don't know, I'm not that smart, but jobs, right? And, and, and opportunities. That's what I hope happens. So how would you define social change? What do you think that term means? You know, I think that, um, I think it's like what Marty's getting at. There are these, People have what they need to live a healthy life. Um, what what else would we need? I mean, if everybody has access to what they need, people will still make bad dis bad decisions, but but at least we'd be closer. You know, if we if people have a home and they have a job and they have health care and they have fun and they have opportunities to engage with their neighbors and other families and support their kids and doing something fun, um, it seems like we'd be a lot closer to what, what should be happening just because it should be happening. I've, we, in all of the neighborhoods that I've had the luxury of living in, um, it's like that. I mean, people are kind to each other. They say hi to each other on the street. They go watch their kids play soccer or, you know, watch me play gymnastics or, you know, do whatever was there to take advantage of to be, um, to grow and to to be have nice these nice opportunities. I mean, it seems like we just have to create those things. So that all of these kids in this neighborhood could realize their potential, right? And have the opportunity to realize their potential. Yeah. And, and I, I, um, so I mean, this idea of enfranchisement and, and social capital, right, gives you the opportunity to voice your desires, what you want. Um, that's I think what. I I mean, and then what the people say they want um, is, is, well, so, 
I mean, at the end of the day, you got to go, you got to go get what you want, and you have to organize in such a way that allows you to move forward. And you can't do that by yourself. So you've got to create groups that can um, leverage um, and 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 maneuver and move forward. And that's what democracy is all about, right? So, but until you're part of the game, you never get anywhere. Right? So you just the, the inclusion of people and the, and the power. I hate this the empowerment of people to to self actuate. So it seems like, would you, do you think that it makes any sense to connect the work that you're doing with the idea of promoting social change? I and mean, do you think that they're, they're, they are connected? I mean, I, I think that is social change. 